Mm. Okay, this one okay, right? That's like this. Or oh, do I have to do like this? Like this? Okay. Okay, yeah, so. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, I'm Chin Hui, and I will, today I'll be talking about like my experience in contributing to Tainas for the first time. So, of course, first question is, okay, what is Pandas? So, okay, a little background. Uh, so, my name is Chin Hui. I am a data engineer at ST Engineering, and I come from a background in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. And, of course, the, the topic of the talk, which is something that I love and I contribute to, which is Pandas. So, what is Pandas? Do we have anyone from data here? Okay, one, two. Yeah, so you all know what is Pandas, right? <laughs> okay, so for, so for those who don't know what is Pandas, maybe this is what you think of. Maybe a big panda, giant panda, or you might be thinking of a red panda. Right. But yes, they are really cute. I love them too, but we're not going to talk about these pandas. Instead, we'll be talking about the library called Pandas. So Pandas is an open source data analysis and manipulation library that's written for Python. So it is written for Python. doesn't mean that it is written in Python, by the way. And so, Panda, so the core concept of Pandas is that it uses data frames as a fundamental high-level building block for data analysis. So anyone else knows, anyone knows R? Okay, so I think for R, you'll have the concept of like, sub data, like data panels and stuff. So what Pandas aims to achieve is something similar to what R could do, which is like having some form of data panels. And this project, Pandas has become so popular that it is now sponsored by NumFocus and it has over like 1,600 contributors and uh, I'm one of them. Yeah, and by the, way, for, by the way, this logo might not look so familiar because it's the new logo for Pandas. Yeah. So why contribute to Pandas? Number one, I'm a data engineer, so I use Pandas in my daily work. Pretty much every single day, every hour, almost every hour, yeah. And when I use pandas to do my work, right, I spend time looking through the docs. So I try to look at the docs, but then somehow I would still end up googling and find my way at Stack Overflow. So there's the docs there, right? But then why am I? Why do I have to keep looking for answers at Stack Overflow? So. It's, a, it's, it's been a bugbear for me for the past one year. So, okay, what better way to mark my first year as a data engineer by contributing to something that I use? Yeah, and something that I'm familiar with. So, why not? So, well, we talk about, oh, I want to contribute to open source. I want to contribute to open source, but well, how do you get started? So, this is how it all started for me. Okay, so, I was look, sort of looking for issues to work, that I can work on in the Pandas repo. So I saw this, saw this particular issue. So what happened was that someone had issues with multi level with the multi levels, multi index, index set levels, and then found it as a bug. So I said, "Help! This is not working as I think it intended according to the docs. So can you fix this issue? Like anyone can help." So, what is the issue? But it turns out that no, it is the intended. Bit. So the docs, the, so it's in the, the multi in, multi level, the like multi index or set level. The intended is like it is working as intended. It's because, so as it turns out, like the person misunderstood how set levels work. But why did he end up misunderstanding it? Unfortunately. As, of, as always, is usually because of the docs, which caused the confusion. So, so the core contributors decided that, hey, maybe we should op we should file it, we should keep the issue and look for contributions and look for someone to help out. So I was like looking through other issues and I was thinking, hmm, should I contribute? Ah? 
Well, I use multi-index in my work, but uh, I'm not, I haven't contributed to, to PEDAS before. So how do I start? How, how? Uh, would they accept, would they allow me to contribute? So I, I just say, well, okay, uh, I could give a try improving these docs if you're okay with it. Uh, so that's it. Why not? Like, they're welcome. Like, you're welcome to contribute. Okay, so I saw that message like, yes, time to get started. But first, before I start, before I have to work on the work on the pull request, right? There are some rules with contributing to pandas. So they have this whole contributing dot md dot md page, which is really very long, has a lot of sections, and I have to keep looking through, like jumping through sections to get through how to contribute. So, well, the first thing that I saw was number one, version control, also known as like, you know, version, version control, we use Git, right? But Git is not so easy. Well, and when we are contributing to the open source project, we try, not, we try to be a good code citizen. We try not to be a code Git, you know? Yeah. Because we have many, many open source contributors who are working on different issues. You have different branches, so on and so forth. So you need to have some rules with doing version control. So some rules. One branch, one feature. Maybe you want to work on multiple features because you say, hey, I want to contribute to a lot, a lot of features, but sorry, one branch, one feature so that people know what you're working on for that branch. And I said step zero, because I didn't, say, I didn't say step one. So step zero before you think, before you start work. Fork the repo. Fork the repo, not git clone, it's fork the repo. So you, you need a GitHub account to do that. And the third master rule, never ever work directly on the master branch. Because, you will go, because if you're working on the master branch, you might break something. And after you fork the repo, make sure that you clone the remote forked repo to your local machine because that's how, that's how we work. We, we can't possibly be contributing to our code via the GUI on the, on the GitHub web page and then go, and go in, edit. It's not very good practice. So since it's a Python project, right? There are some style guides that we have to follow like for a, a, any Python open source project. So one would be PEP8, which is the style guide for Python code. So if you code in Python, you must know PEP8. If you code in Python and you don't know PEP8, it doesn't. It means that you don't know Python. So Pep8 is the grandfather of coding style guidelines for Python projects. So different different Python projects may have slightly different guidelines, but ultimately the objective is it, it goes back to Pep8, which is consistency. Because you want consistency across your codes. So if you want consist and then you have so many people working on the on the code base, on the docs and stuff. So if you're not consistent, right, then it's going to be a huge mess. Everybody's not going to be happy. So you have to follow the style guide or you get dev stairs. Or in this case, you're going to get digital dev stairs. Yeah, like that. So we talk about Pep A, all the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the style guide, right? But there's one, one other style guide which could easily overlook. overlook which is PEP257. So PEP257 is about the doc string convention. So what is a doc string? So, uh, so, so the doc string will be a string literal in code. And in, 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 in case of in Python, right, the doc string is actually very important because it also acts as a documentation for your scripts and modules. So let's say, right, let's say I use requests or I use pandas, or I use some other Python library, and then I'm still start starting, to, starting to use it. So I may not be familiar with all the syntax, what input to put in, and stuff like that. So, so let's say, right, if I'm using VS Code, and then I go and shift my mouse, and then I go and see that the function, and then whatever I see, right, will be the doc string. So that doc string is very, 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 very important. Yeah. So for well, doc string, right? They have a very. They also have their rules. 
So it's not just I just comments, long, long lines, and then that's it. You can do that for your personal project, but you can't do that for open source project where there's so many eyes looking at you. So, so, there's, so the standard is that you must have a one line summary. One line only. One line. Cannot be two lines, three lines, four lines. Must be one line. And sometimes you have some description and examples. So examples, right, is actually the most important part of your doc stream because that is how like let's say if I want to learn re how to use requests and then I, I and then I don't know how to use it, the examples will help me understand how the function works. But well, a lot of things, right? If you don't, just refer to the contributing guidelines. Each project will have a contributing guideline, and then you just click on the section that you need, and then ta da! All the commands are there already. So after all those rules, right? Okay, I make my first pull request. So before I make my first pull request, I clone a repo already. I have to create an isolated development and environment. So I mean, you 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 have you you need to you need to practice that for like JavaScript and other languages. But for Python, it's especially important because unfortunately, Python is known for is very infamous for being really bad at managing dependencies. So. You, you make sure to create it in an isolated environment such because you do not want dependency hell. Yeah. You don't want dependency hell. It's not, it's not pleasant. Um, so why do you need an isolated development environment? Because you are not downloading pandas from the library, from PyP, from Honda or anything. You are actually building and installing pandas from source. So it's already from the code base itself. And since your pandas is not built, it's not really built entirely in Python. It actually has C C extensions in it, so you need a C compiler. And then after you install the C compiler, and then you build and install Python from scratch, then finally you install your optional dependencies. So after all this, right, when you when you search in, when you do import pandas in the environment. You should not see 0 0.25.2 or 0 0.25.3. You should be seeing a dev environment. So if you see 0 0.25.2 or 0 0.25.3 or anything other than dev environment, that means you've done something wrong. And then secondly, after I have the environment ready, right, I go into the environment and then I work on and then I do commit changes in the feature branch. So what does that mean by a local feature branch? So because um, you because in your GitHub, right, you have the remote, you have a remote repo, and then at first you have a master. So you have a master, right? You clone the and then you clone the, you clone to local. So you have a local master branch. But then before you do anything, right? Because maybe you clone already, and then they might make some updates. So you don't really want to have much conflicts. Right? So you have to update your local master branch with the upstream master branch because. Because actually every day they will make changes to the rep to the master repo, uh. so you have to keep updated, keep, keep updating. And then after you have an updated local master branch, right? Then you go and work on a new feature branch to make your changes. So don't touch the master code, uh, because master branch, because master branch is for production ready code. So if you mess with the master branch, uh, good luck. And as mentioned earlier. I, I, you know, we all love to do a lot of things to something, yeah, but stick to one branch for one feature or bug. If not, uh, if not, people don't know, like, for this branch, what are you working on? And then after you do all your changes and stuff, right, you push the changes to your remote feature branch. So before you do that, right, make sure git commit. Please, git commit. Sometimes I forget that. And then, and then you say, oh, we have nothing to commit. But you have to make changes, right? But you have to commit. <laughs> and then when you commit, right, don't just say update A, uh, let's say I did A, I did B, I did C, or what. I don't know what's A, B, or C. So please write meaningful commit messages because people will see your commit messages. And then please keep style fixes to a separate commit. So that's a sub point. Because let's say I edit my text, uh, I did my tag, like the docs. But then I have some formatting error. Right? Then I do back vendors. And then you say, uh, 
uh, you have one trailing white space here. You have one trailing white space there. Then you have to call, then cannot be, you just anyhow push everything into one commit, right? So please keep style fixes to a separate commit. And then now I have something that, like now I have something on a remote branch, remote branch, right? Like the remote feature branch. Before I make the pull request from my, from my remote feature branch to the upstream branch. Number one, must always, 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 always check for stylistic errors in your code. So this is related to pep 8. So for that, pandas say, let's use black pandas or git diff. Usually you pick up something, something like that's go, that goes wrong with your code. Lah. So this one is in the contributing guide and I tested it. And point number two, for your doc string, right, you must check the formatting and examples for doc strings. So how do we check whether the doc string is okay or not? Well, you don't have a, you don't really have a, oh, like a tool that is very openly available. But for pandas, right, they have prepared a script for you to do that. So in the repo, right, you just run a script to validate your doc string to check whether you are following certain standards or whether your examples work or not. Sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> and last but not least, after you have done your PEP, A or 257, you think that you may have covered everything, but please review your code. Maybe you might have made some spelling mistakes. And then if you make some very embarrassing spelling mistakes or you accidentally propose a secret in your code, and then you push it up, then everybody knows your secret. So please review your code before you push your master password out for the whole world to see. And after I push, right? Okay, so usually you get feedback from the maintainers. So usually, so you will usually get some feedback to say, oh, I would like to make some changes. So it doesn't mean that you push up and then that's it, job done. Okay, I can go to sleep now. No, nope, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. So that's when the actual open source work begins. Because that's when you start communicating with the, con with the contributors. So for example, right, let's say like, mm, you have, they, they will leave some comments and then, they, that's, and then they will also suggest certain changes to make. So in this case, right, some, add some comments. So for example, like my, my dot string is in double line, not single line. So they say, Single line, please. Okay, so, okay, oops, uh, noted. Yeah, so don't expect your initial pull request to be perfect. And, but yeah, you may make some mistakes, but it's okay, because co 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 contributors are your mentors. They are there to help you. And feedback is a gift. So you learn from the core contributors, you learn more about the project, and then so, and getting feedback is actually a good thing, because it means that someone in the project actually cares about your work in case of our contributions. So number two, you might have to keep making loads and loads of changes to your pull request because for open source project, right, it's always quickly developing. Every day you might make some, there might be some changes. So there might be a point whereby you might have a merge conflict. So to, so to resolve the merge conflict, right, you will have to manually resolve them because and if you don't, somebody will complain. Yeah, and besides much besides much conflicts, right? Maybe one contributor, maybe one co one maintainer say, yeah, I think this is I think this is a good idea. But another con contributor might have a better approach. So you might so that's it doesn't mean that just because one co co contributor said it's okay, that you you are you are good to go. Okay, so how to update your pull request? Or actually, not so soon. Uh. It's more of how not to update your pull request. Now I'm going to be talking about this very horrible thing called nuking with your good, nuking with good git rebase. So what happened is that in mid October, Python 3.8 support was released. So good thing, very good, right? Because people wanted to try Python 3.8. And then they say, what, Pandas, can you please, please, please support 3.8 faster? Yeah, but then, Good for be good for those who want to play and try out, but not so not so good for me because pull requests will need to pass new tests for Python three point eight, 
and mistake number one, forget to up, forget to update from the master branch. So what happened is that I tried very desperately to fix my pull request, tried all sorts of ways, and then end up with a lot of merge conflicts here and there, and then blah blah blah, and then somehow my and I, I found a way, and then I, my PR finally passed the new test. So very good, right? Passed test already. Yay! Can go to sleep already. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, right? <laughs> but then the next morning I woke up this. And this email. So what happened was that someone said, so one of the co contributors said, uh, I'm not sure what happened, but you end up having like 200 plus like git and showing up in your git div, and then this is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and all the comments are there. <laughs> like, okay, okay, this is bad. So I look at my, I look at the git, I look at the the branch diagram, and this is what happened. <laughs> so I have my formatting changes, formatting changes, explicit level, doc string, all those things, and then okay. So the, so the, so my my feature branch is actually the, this blue one, doc fix. So by right, right, if I've done my done done the merge property, yeah, this this will be in the blue one. But then what actually happened was that, look at the blue one. It's got everything from the master commit. So to put it bluntly, I nuked my branch. So what to do? What to do? So can, yeah. So it turns out that I made a very common mistake. First, I did a git rebase upstream, and then whoop, this is what happens. So I kind of started posting a bit of a, a rant and stuff like, like, oh, I made this mistake. What should I do? So, so I posted on Twitter because you know, all the tech people are on Twitter. So, so what happened is that so what actually happened is that you know, I, I shouldn't be using git rebase. So this is what uh, what uh, Mark Garcia, one of the core contributors of Pandas, said. So by right, I should be doing a fetch first to fetch what is the difference between my my branch and the and the project branch. After I get the difference, right, I match the difference. So that is what I'm supposed to be doing. But then because I just because I just practically want to get the job done, I just rebase. Well you can you can do that if you are in a local repo, but you can't do that when you're working on an open source project, right? So what actually what actually happened is that there was some diver there was some diverging endpoints. Because while I'm working on my feature, the the project is actually up constantly updating. So there is some diver so, so there is some diver diverging nodes here. So if I do a proper git merge, right, I will should be joining the nodes, merging the changes in a new commit. So it will so in a way it will look quite nice. And then when people when people make further commits, right, they're just gonna keep adding on and on and on very nicely. But if you do git rebase, right, this is what happens you end up adding the entire master branch onto an experiment node. Well, if, well if, that, if the difference is only about one or two, it's not so bad, but no, that is 200 plus over commits. So it's not good. Yeah, so imagine this whole thing, 200 commits, you go and add to your branch. And then some more, and then it gets worse, though. No. Let's say if some if somebody did not catch that, then you have so then you keep updating the master branch, and then one fine day you will say, hey, your changes look good. Let's go and merge it. And if you merge it right, you may remember C4 is two hundred over commit. Then your branch is not going to be very nice and neat. Yeah. So 
And then somebody else go and work on another feature. And then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So look at this branch. Do you think it's a good branch? <laughs> yeah. So imagine, imagine if someone had not caught this problem. Oh, okay, okay. So what did I do? Well, well thankfully the pandas, pandas contributors are quite nice people. So I didn't get dev stats for that. And then so I so after all this whole all this whole ha right, then I actually went to look at what actually went wrong. So from this book called Pro Git, which I have read before, but Apparently, I have not internalized the lesson. The lesson is, do not rebase commits that you have pushed to a public repo. Never. You can do it in local repo, but please don't do that in a public repo. Because the whole world will see and they will start cursing you at you. Okay, so this is disastrous. So how do I recover from a git rebase? Anyone? Anyone have any ideas? <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to start a new branch. And before you start a new branch, make sure your master branch is updated. So, after the whole disaster, is now making my first pull request version 2. So this time, I know my lesson. I'm not going to do a git rebase or anything. So the same whole thing is happening again. Commit the changes in your new local feature branch, the same old thing. Make sure that I work on one feature blah, blah, or for one branch, so on and so forth. And then I push changes to my new remote feature branch. Yeah, still the same steps. And then, well, it looks like all's good, right? Yo, I've, taken, I've taken account of feedback from the maintainers, so it should be okay, right? No. Not really, because after a week, a much conflict occurred. Oh. Yeah, because while I'm working on because while I'm working on my branch, and then it's been a week, but then a lot of things happen within a week, and then it, and then there's some merge conflict. How do I know that? Because I received an email saying that there's a merge conflict. Oh. So please pay attention to your work. Like whether, whether there's any merge conflicts. If not, somebody will complain to you that you have a merge conflict. Yeah. So merge conflict, what to do? Turns out I have to do it manually. Yeah. So <laughs> it is hard. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes instead of going round and round trying to try all sorts of things, right? It's better to ask the community for help, lah. Then I don't need to go through all the 200 plus commit errors already. And then after that, right? I, I, after that, I resolved the merge conflict. Then more feedback because different, main, different, dif different, main, different core contributors will have different opinions. Mm. Mm, so make more changes. I have to update my pull request, right? Because somewhat, because I have to get feedback, I have to make changes. So step zero. Now I know that I should, like after I get feedback, I should update my local feature branch with the changes in the upstream master. So this one is step zero. Before I do that, I cannot do anything else. And then step one, make changes to a local feature branch, review a code. So this time I make sure that I review properly, I do my black pen, I do my black pandas, I check my PEP8, PEP257, and then I push to my remote feature branch. And then, changes are proof. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's so, which means that it's been added to at a milestone. But that, also, that doesn't mean that the work ends here. Because we, they will have, because we will have to look through and to see whether it is ready for release. But the good thing is that most likely whatever you're going to contribute will go into one of the future release. So, yay! So some key takeaways. Contributing on docs is usually a, is a, actually a very good way to learn more about the project. You get free feedback and mentorship from the core contributors. 
So because like let's say I'm because I'm, I'm currently using multi levels quite quite a fair bit, and then I'm when I'm contributing to the part of the documentation, so I actually understand what that particular function does better, and then. And then thirdly, contributing guidelines is effectively code adequate. Please, please, please look through it. Even though it's very long, but it can save you some trouble. And last but not least, it's also a very good way for you to learn Git by doing. Even if you're contributing to the, to the docs, you may not be contributing to the code base or anything, but ultimately, you will still need to use Git. So, if you are getting started with contributing to a project like a big project like Pandas, you can also you can contribute to the docs and you can learn Git at the same time. And so, if you if you like my talk, or if you if you want to find, if you want to talk to me more about what I'm up to, you can reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, maybe GitHub, and I have my own web page. So thank you.